From August 1989 to September 1990, two young Australian women lived with the Burmese student army. They documented their stay in Burma with a video 8 camera. This is their story. Well, I was studying photography for two and a half years and when I finished that, I just I really needed something to do. It was getting frustrating finding work here and th I really wanted to do photojournalistic work rather than something like fashion or advertising and it was really hard to find here. Linda and I had arranged to meet in Bangkok and it was there that we heard stories about a group of students who were living on the border between Thailand and Burma. They'd fled Burma because of what had happened during a military coup in 1988. So we decided to go up there for the weekend, but we ended up staying on the border for over a year. The people we'd met had been shot at, imprisoned and tortured by their own military government. They were desperate to tell the world what was happening in Burma and we wanted to help. Two tickets to Sydney, please. We were on the border of Thailand and Burma in an area called the Liberated Zone. It's a military area held by the Burmese ethnic groups. These people have been fighting the Burmese military for independence for over 40 years. Because we were taking a video camera into a war zone, I kept thinking I should feel a sense of danger. But to be honest, I felt excited. I felt like this trip was going to be a real personal test. It was also my first trip to the Burmese border, but I'd been inside Burma before. I'd been to Rangoon and Mandalay in 1985. I didn't know much about Burmese politics then. In fact, I didn't really know much about Burma at all. I knew that it was a Buddhist country and that the Allied forces had fought there in World War II. My grandmother used to tell us stories about her brother who disappeared as a POW building the Burma Railway. So I decided to take my Super 8 camera with me to film and find his grave. One of the most surprising things about arriving in Burma was that it was like the clock had stopped in 1940. I tried to imagine what it was like for my great uncle in World War II. It just seemed miles away from any war movie I'd seen on television. It is among our bitterest memories of war that freeborn Australians, taken prisoner when Malaya fell, were treated like slaves. Like work beasts, they were driven to toil in the tropical sun. Men died like flies. Not only Australians, but 18,000 white men in all, and more than 70,000 other races. They say a man died for every sleeper laid along this track. I went to the World War II cemetery, but it was huge. I walked up and down the rows looking for Private Jim Ryan, but I couldn't find his grave. There were lots of unidentified soldiers, so I filmed one of their graves instead. I got on a local bus back to Rangoon, but when it was stopped at a military checkpoint, I got pulled off. The senior officer tried to question me in Burmese. He kept asking about the Karen. I realise now he was asking me about one of the so-called rebel groups up on the border. But at the time, I didn't know what he was talking about. Then they put me on a military truck and said I had to leave Burma. It's 
Standing at the Korean checkpoint reminded me of the experience I had in 1985. In the end, all that happened to me was that I was thrown out of Burma. But that experience made me really want to find out what was happening in this country and why there were university students living in camps all along the border. It was an early hour especially chosen by Burmese astrologers to mark Burma's full assumption of independence. In place of the Union Jack, the Burmese national flag was hoisted with all due ceremony. It's a tragedy for Burma that Aung San, who worked so hard for this day, didn't live to see the Burmese flag flying over Rangoon. During the war, Aung San convinced the Burmese people to support the Japanese in exchange for a promise of independence. It wasn't long before he lost faith in the Japanese and Burma's army joined the Allied forces. Aung San's shifting allegiance was forgiven and his commitment to Burma was acknowledged as he represented the Burmese people in independence negotiations with the British cabinet at 10 Downing Street. Then, only months later, disaster struck. Aung San and many of the country's new leaders were ruthlessly gunned down at a cabinet meeting. If anyone could have assured a smooth and united path to democracy, it was this gun leader. As we found out more about the history of Burma, I realised how frustrating the struggle for democracy must have been for the Burmese people. Some of the most shocking things that happened there in the last 50 years, and I just, it just felt like no one knew anything about it. This is Lloyd Williams reporting from Burma. After 14 years of a teetering democracy, the Burmese army seized control of the country today in what is claimed to be a bloodless coup. General Ney Win said the army had been forced to act because of the steadily deteriorating economic and political situation. Ney Win has been commander of the Burmese army since 1948. For a decade, he's been the most powerful man in Burmese politics. Although the general seems in a strong position now, Observers in Rangoon believe the situation may still be unstable. At first I thought the student camps would be really like refugee camps. Everyone's starving, really poor conditions and generally depressing. But it wasn't, it was more like a holiday camp. It was hard for me to believe that there were stories of hardship behind so many smiling faces. But that feeling soon changed when we started finding out what really happened in Burma in 1988. In the Burmese capital Rangoon, anti-government protests continue to escalate. The demonstrations are led by students carrying portraits of General Aung San, the hero of Burmese independence. For four months now, the students have been calling for an end to Burma's repressive one-party system and for the resignation of military ruler Ne Win. Once one of Asia's richest countries, Burma has been reduced to grinding poverty by General Ne Win's economic policy known as the Burmese Road to Socialism. Student leaders vow to continue the protest until their demands for economic and political reforms are met. In a surprise announcement, General Ne Win has resigned as leader of the party that has ruled Burma for the last 26 years. However, student leaders claim that he's still pulling the strings. The new government has promised democratic elections, but the students say they don't believe these pledges and that their protests will continue until an election date is announced. Although the students had fled to the border, they were far from victims. As we recorded their stories, we felt an incredible empathy with them. The reality is that they're university and school students same age as us and with similar backgrounds. 
Before the democracy marches, I attended school regularly. There was nothing to worry about. My father was a public servant, and we weren't in want of money, and I didn't have to work. We weren't rich, but we weren't poor either. We were middle class, like most people. I never had strong feelings for or against the military government, although I was aware of what was going on. One day, we were sitting in a tea shop near the traffic lights, and an army vehicle stopped, and these soldiers jumped off from it. We couldn't run anywhere. They called us out. I went out. But there was a young Muslim boy who was terrified, and he started to run. One of the soldiers shot him with a rifle. The boy fell on the road. He wasn't dead yet. He was moaning and clutching his stomach. And then the sergeant finished him off by shooting him in the temple point blank. And then the um, soldiers lifted his body and threw him over the edge of the spot over where the bushes were. And the army car left. Yesterday, anti-government protests continued throughout Burma. The government has responded with the imposition of martial law. And tourists report dozens of army trucks and soldiers moving towards the city centre. Soldiers killed three nurses at this spot outside Rangoon Hospital on Wednesday afternoon. The killings follow a week of indiscriminate shooting by the Burmese military, resulting in hundreds of deaths. Another government leader has been forced to resign because of the continuing student protests. Latest pictures from the Burmese capital show university students rejoicing as members of the armed forces join in demonstrations calling for democratic elections. Student leaders are optimistic about After this new development. After massive demonstrations in Rangoon, General Saw Mong has seized power in a military coup. However, experts say that General Saw Mong and other senior army officers still remain loyal to long-term ruler General Ne Win. The fate of emerging opposition leaders isn't yet known, but only yesterday a new political spokesperson, Ong San Suu Kyi, called for the army to stay out of politics. Split up. We want the armed forces to keep, to keep together, but to keep out of politics. Observers fear that the campaign for democracy could end in even more bloodshed. I live in Taketa. The military had blocked the roads, so no one was allowed into the city. There were soldiers waiting at all the blockades. There's a bridge, Tuwana Bridge, and our demonstration crowd were coming through that way. There were young children in front. They said to the soldiers, please let us pass, and the soldier nodded his head. After they'd taken two or three steps, the soldiers started shooting at the school children who were holding pictures and posters of General Aung San. About ten people were killed and the rest of the crowd came running back. We had to leave the bodies there. We were marching around the streets. The smaller children from the primary schools were in the front. They were holding flags. The army shot at them. And a child holding a flag fell. Another student caught hold of the flag so he wouldn't fall. The flag kept changing hands like that as the army kept shooting at the person holding it. Finally, a child holding the flag ran away. We saw people getting killed, but we got away and reassembled the protest march. When we got to Bahan, the army was there and surrounded us from left and right. Some of the children didn't know where to run, so they ran into the royal lake, and about 50 of them drowned in the lake. These pictures, taken after last week's coup, show the army using force to put down demonstrations. The anti-government protesters, men, women and children, had to take cover as soldiers fired indiscriminately into a march on the American embassy. As people cowered hopelessly, more shots rang out and another man was wounded. The Burmese military government maintains that the death toll was low. Mr. Ong Jo, Director General of the Political Department of the Foreign Affairs Ministry. Uh, the demonstrators, they were 
about uh, 20, but 525 looters. 525 looters. The injured were carried to safety in a hail of bullets, with the soldiers determined to put down all opposition to military rule, apparently firing at anyone that moved. Opposition sources claim that the number of people killed in the street fighting is close to 1,000. I'd always taken the freedom to demonstrate for granted, but the Burmese people have had that right taken away from them. So when we got back to Australia, we contacted the Burmese community here to see if we could get involved with their activities. And most of those people had escaped from Burma after the 1962 coup because of the oppression of the government. And they were still actively protesting for democracy in Burma. I happen to have been studying at Rangoon University uh, as a young student uh, in 1962. And uh, the first student resistance happened only four months after the coup. That was in July. I can still remember that. We were just protesting uh, against the uh, regimental style of the hostel rule on the university campus. And all of a sudden, without any warning being given, they shot us with automatic rifles, automatic guns. Uh, which had claimed uh, the lives of over 200 students. So because of the tradition uh, of the students, students' involvement in the resistance, the stu students are always in the, in the forefront of casualties. Every Burmese person we've ever met has had a shocking experience at the hands of the Burmese military. And we wanted to travel along the border to document as many of these stories as possible. So the camp commander assigned Lam Bois as our bodyguard to help us move between the different camps. For the next 10 months, we went up and down the border, hearing hundreds of horror stories about the Burmese military and what they'd done. It seemed like no one was exempt from the Burmese military. But for me, it was really the stories of the people arrested and tortured that really got to me. First, they asked us to ride a motorcycle. They asked us to ride like this on our tippy toes. After a while, the toes start trembling and shaking. When we started shaking, they hit us with cycle tires and kicked us. We also have to make noises like boom, 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 continuously until they got what they wanted. We have to go like this for hours. Sometimes we put our heels down to rest our legs. If we do that, they hit us. We start to tremble, they hit us. Another time they brought stones and put them in front of me. I had to kneel on these stones for a long time. Kneel like this. You know? On sharp stones, stones like these. I had to stay like these for hours. Under these conditions in the prisons, you are beaten down. Your pride and your self-esteem are beaten down. I can't remember how many times we were taken out and beaten. We kept collapsing and falling down. I could never make you understand how bad it was. It was so disgusting. I don't want to talk about it. I can't forgive what they did either in this life or in the next. Countless methods of torture were used, like the motorcycle, being forced to walk on our knees on a pile of sharp stones, rolling a pipe up and down your shin bone, pulling out hairs from our shins. It was living hell with sounds of beatings and tortures and cries of people, including women and girls. The female students who were arrested and detained were molested and raped in the jails. Some of these girls committed suicide rather than face the shame of these rapes. Most Burmese women would be hesitant to take that sort of action. 
When we heard about these rapes, all the women in the country were outraged. After these inhumane actions of the army in jail, these rapes, we realized that it was important for women to take a prominent role in this revolution. Aung San Suu Kyi, the daughter of Burma's independence hero, is seen by many Burmese as the natural choice to lead the country. She became involved in Burmese politics in August last year after returning home to care for her dying mother. For most of her life she's lived overseas, most recently in England with her British husband and family. But when the massacres occurred last year, she emerged as a leader in the pro-democracy movement, advocating a Gandhi-style non-violent resistance. All we can say is what we want. We want a lot of moral support from those countries where they enjoy democracy to the full. After all, we are a country where we can't even be sure of our, of our security, of our personal security. There are many people who are going in fear of their lives. Yesterday, their Aung San Suu Kyi was imprisoned in her own home with soldiers surrounding the house. Her only crime was to speak out against a brutal military regime. I didn't realise that what had happened in Burma was on such a large scale. It felt like the students had come so close to forcing a peaceful revolution. Then overnight the movement had been crushed and the universities were closed down by the government so the students couldn't organise the people anymore. I couldn't understand why Australian businesses were still permitted to trade with this regime. Economics didn't seem to be a good enough excuse. It wasn't hard for me to understand why they'd left the cities en masse and come out here to take up guns. When Somong took over power on the 18th, I got hold of a lot of young people and my school students and told them they would have to start a revolution with guns. The only way we could get what we wanted and resolve the country's problems was to go into the jungle and start an armed revolution. So we got together and came away with only the clothes on our back and a bottle of water each. By the time I got to Thaibao Bo camp, I was in very bad shape. I couldn't walk any further. When I arrived, my number was already 2,045, and 3,000 to 4,000 more students arrived after me. A lot of people came out, but we all had the same aim, and that was to fight for democracy in an armed struggle. When we left Rangoon for Karen independent land, we thought that the Karens were rebels and insurgents, that they destroyed houses, set fire to villages, raped and molested people, like the government propaganda said. We saw them as robbers and bad people. But when we got here and were face to face with them on their own land, we found that the Karens treated us like brother and sister. They took care of us, they helped us, and we realised that they were not at all like what the government said in their propaganda. There's 11 main ethnic groups in the liberated zone, but we spent most of our time with the Karens. Most of the Karen groups live in the mountain and border areas of Burma, and they've always protected their strong cultural identity. At the beginning of World War II, they defended their interests by joining with the Allied forces in their fight against the Japanese and have been fighting the Burmese government for the same reasons ever since. We are fighting now because the Burmese military are governing in a dictatorial fashion, oppressing people to the extent that they find it difficult to make a living. That's what we are struggling about. At first we asked only to be able to make a living, but that was a bit like asking for elections. We didn't ask in a quarrelsome way. But instead of solving our problems, they arrested us, tortured us, found faults with us, and detained, jailed, and killed some of our prominent Karen citizens. That's why in the end, we had to take up arms and fight. <laughs> Oh, 
It is right and just that the students are fighting for democratic rights so that the people of Burma can be freed from oppressive rule. That's what the Karens are also fighting for. So we are prepared to work together. After we'd been living with the students for a while, I realised how wrong my first impressions were. It was no holiday camp. The students had organised themselves into an army called the All Burma Students Democratic Front, or the ABSDF. And they had camps all along the liberated zone. Life with the students was very regimented. They got up at 5.30 every morning to do military training. And even if they didn't have any weapons, they'd use anything, even if it was bamboo. After the military training, although we were determined to go to the battlefront, we weren't able to because we didn't have any weapons. So, instead of going to the front line, we went into medical posts and went into the villages and helped people there. Those of us who did military training went on to the next first aid course. We also taught in the village schools and fulfilled what was really needed by the ethnic people, a good basic education. Although the students were out in the middle of the jungle, it didn't stop them from setting up their own universities in huts so that they could learn about the world they'd been cut off from. They were so different to students in Australia who'd find all sorts of excuses not to go to a class. These students wanted to learn. They wanted to know how to politically organise the frontline villages. And they were desperate to find out what democracy meant for people in other countries. Burma is holding its first multi-party election in three decades. But opposition leaders in Rangoon claim that the election is being staged in order to improve the government's international image. Despite the participation of 93 parties fielding over 2,000 candidates, the military government controls the campaign. Rallies are under surveillance by military intelligence and meetings of more than five people are banned. Many opposition leaders have been arrested and Aung San Suu Kyi, the popular symbol of hope in Burma, is still imprisoned in her own home. In another country. Yeah, another country. When the elections were announced, it was all the students talked about. Would they be free and fair? Would the National League for Democracy win? The feeling out here was disbelief that elections were actually going to happen. There was a cautious kind of optimism. When the elections were announced, the Burmese people got prepared. People grouped themselves into parties to contest the elections. Almost all the parties were anti Nguyen. However, because the people disliked Nguyen and his party, so many parties sprung up, parties that no one had ever heard of before. And a large number of parties gave Nguyen the advantage. Nguyen's party had all the money, staff, officers and transport. That's why I thought the Democratic parties didn't have much chance of winning this election. If they are government, we can stop this and... But as the date for the elections got closer, the students got more optimistic and it really felt like it was going to happen. Even on the border, the build-up was really exciting. Lindo and I didn't know where to be and what to film because there was so much going on. They wanted to let the world know what was happening to make sure the election would be free and fair.
In a surprisingly free and fair election, the opposition National League for Democracy won an overwhelming 80% of the vote, even though popular party leader Aung San Suu Kyi remains under house arrest. Almost none of the candidates backed by the military government were elected. But the national polls are only the beginning and the army is still in control. In a volatile climate, observers are skeptical about any swift transfer to democracy. Casting his vote, the country's official leader, Suo Mong, gave no indication he would respect the results of the election. I'll transfer the, my, the power according to the law. That's all. <laughs> Which means, in effect, when he decides to. Nor would he say when the opposition leaders will be free again. Will there be amnesty for political prisoners? No, no, no. No, this is not my business. Not my business. <laughs> After the elections, everyone just waited and waited, hoping that the government would announce a transfer of power, but knowing that they probably wouldn't. It was just like the demonstrations, where they were given a little taste of what it could be like, but then all their hopes were taken away. The National League for Democracy triumphed with a majority of votes, but after our victory, things became even more restrictive. The military government started issuing more restrictive orders, especially when movements of the NLD leaders and elected MPs were concerned. We were closely watched and limited in what we could do by the military intelligence. That's why the National League for Democracy was in a position where it could do nothing whatsoever. We had no alternative but to follow the road that the students paved after the massacres in 1988. The students we'd been living with had had to wait for about two years for the Karens to give them the guns. They had to complete their military training first. But when the guns finally arrived, the camp took on a totally different atmosphere. Everything got really serious. We knew then it wouldn't be long before they'd be going out to the front line on political organising missions. Of course we were afraid about going to the front line. We're only human. But on the day we got the guns, we were also given equipment and uniforms. That night, while we were altering our uniforms, trying to make ourselves look like real soldiers, everyone was excited, wondering whether it was really going to happen and if it would be okay. By the time dawn broke, none of us had slept a wink. The students in the Koran had learned through past experience not to trust anybody, and that included Sophie and I. We didn't gain automatic trust. Hurry, hurry. Have you got a torch? When we went to the frontline villages, we were given 15 minutes to get our stuff together. We weren't allowed to know where we were going. We were taken in the night. We weren't even told the names of the places we were passing through. But we wanted to go to the front line because the front line was everything the students had been working towards.
想你了。In the morning, we found ourselves in a frontline village, and we were told to sort off where it was. It was a Karen trading post. The students had regrouped here to have a briefing before they went off on political organising missions, and for some of them to combat. While we were in the frontline village, there was this incident with a 14-year-old Buddhist novice who joined the student army. Linda and I did an interview with him, but he couldn't quite get his story straight on whether or not he liked the Burmese military. We heard later that he'd been caught listening to a private military meeting and been accused of being a spy. There was a trial, but we never really found out the whole story. He was so young, at the end of the interview he really wanted us to film him doing karate. But in the liberated zone, the penalty for spying is death, even if you're 14 years old. And so not long after the interview, this boy was executed. It was a dilemma for me, as I'm sure it was for most of the students I was with, when we heard he was executed. I was really anti-execution on the one hand, but this kid could have contributed to us and our whole group being killed. As far as we're concerned, we don't want to fight our own Burmese people. We are fellow nationals. We don't want to fight them. Our main goal and reason for being here is to topple the military government by fighting them with guns. That's why we have gone underground. We would like just to hold chalk, but we have been forced to hold the trigger of a gun. I have brothers and sisters on the enemy's side, and I love them a lot. I'm sure they don't like the government and know it's no good. But at the moment, they can't leave because they have to depend on the government for their living. I think one day when we meet, they will join forces with us and we will have to prepare for that day, to try and work together. But at the moment, when we go into battle, if I meet my cousins who are officers in the Burmese army, I will shoot them and they will shoot at me. That's my decision. <laughs> The irony of the whole frontline struggle was that more students were dying from malaria than they were by bullets from the Burmese military. I never really knew quite what to do when I was documenting this type of suffering. I always felt really torn, feeling like I was intruding and trying to convince myself that what I was doing was helping. But the decision to film or take photos was never an easy one for me when these people were in so much pain. <laughs> When the students first came out here, they thought that after three months, they would be able to win the fight and go back home to study. But the reality was they had to face a lot of difficulties. As this is a malaria area, they all got it after two or three weeks of arriving here. They have really suffered. Some of them who were taken along to the front lines have had to face being in battles. They had no experience of what that would be like. Some of them get depressed because of these fighting experiences. Some because they miss home, as they've never left home before. 
and some get depressed because the food and medicine we have here is very poor. We went to the front line not really realising what a front line meant in Burma. It was continually moving. We started to hear that the Burmese military were advancing closer to the village we were in. We'd come to the front line to film and the front line had moved back to where we'd been living only weeks ago. The roads had been cut and we couldn't move. Then I heard about the Burmese military's new four-point plan to destroy the insurgency movement. It was called the four-cut policy. Cut supply, cut financial resources, cut communication and cut heads. It was a bit scary being stuck in the front line because we didn't know quite where we were, how we were going to get out or when the signal would be given. But when the camp commander came and said, you've got 20 minutes to be on this car and out to the border, we got our stuff together and left. We felt really sad about leaving because the students were going off in the other direction, closer to danger. We didn't know what was going to happen to them or whether we'd ever see them again. The summer offensive had begun. The Burmese military were attacking and the camps were falling like dominoes along the border. This happened every year, and every year the armies in the liberated zone would fight them off. But the liberated zone is getting smaller and smaller now. With the Burmese military advancing towards the border, any of the students left in the camps were forced to flee to Thailand. But they weren't the only ones. The Karen villages in the frontline areas were also being attacked and their homes destroyed and looted. This fighting resulted in thousands of people being crammed into refugee camps up and down the border. It's very tragic. We've had to leave our own country and run away to other people's countries. We came out here to be part of a revolution for Burma. And we've had to leave our camps and our country behind and live as refugees instead of being able to fight the enemy. This is really very sad. None of the students want to stay here. Like them, I don't want to live here either. Our life here is work today or we won't eat tomorrow. The children here are in a very pathetic and painful position. They are the future people of this country and the school here is impoverished. We feel that we will never forgive this government. We will always challenge them. Just look at my child. He had malaria when he was two months old. He had to take the malaria drug chloroquine. His life is this environment. He will be seeing only refugee camps. He will not be experiencing anything that will develop him. There is nothing here that will develop his intelligence. He doesn't know what a movie is. He doesn't know the meaning of electricity. He hasn't even seen a water tap, many things. As refugees from Burma, we are not worth even the little toes of the people of the developing world. And everybody is pointing the finger at us, as if we had created the problem. We are suffering, and it makes me sad. In the refugee camps in Thailand and Bangladesh, we met a lot of villagers who'd packed up their whole lives and fled Burma because the Burmese military kept raiding their towns for porters. They'd take the men to carry loads of ammunition and weapons for them to the front line. And in the process, they'd commit some of the worst human rights abuse I've ever heard of. Can he describe what happened? I want him to tell the story of this. 
My son was sick for two days, so I was taking him to see a doctor. On the way, the army stopped us and took me as a porter. And my son tried to run away, but he fell over and broke his leg. A soldier went over to him and beat him. Six months ago, this woman's husband was taken away by the Burmese military as a porter. She went to search for him and found him dying. Both his hands were nailed. Yes, they had put nails through his hands. The soldiers had cut off his penis and put it in his mouth. This child's father. The Burmese soldiers had put his penis in his mouth. We had gone to search for him and saw him fall, face down, dead. Dead. I couldn't bear it and went home. After that, at about 1 or 1.30 a.m., a group of soldiers came to my house. About 12 of them came in and raped me. I have three children and they started crying. So the soldiers beat them. When I tried to protect them, they hit me in the chest. A soldier hit me in the chest with his boot. Then I was raped again. Surprised to be going home? Ah. I'd heard that the Burmese military's use of porters was like slavery, that they were worked to the ground until they died, or if they were lucky, they'd escape, and then they usually went straight home. So their stories were really hard to get first hand. That's why we had to wait for months to do these interviews. And here. Could he hold his arm? And does he have injury on the back? The porters told us stories of how they were used by the Burmese military to carry loads of up to 60 kilos over mountains without any food or water and how they are often used to walk through minefields as human minesweepers. I think that even these people were shocked that they were still alive. Most of their families had already held funerals for them because they never expected them to come home. This is from the long walk and long journey. Living in Mokhe refugee camp is very difficult. Even a normal everyday routine is hard here. It's depressing. The worst that could have possibly happened has happened in our lives. In my own case, Nguyen has dictated this country for 26 years, and I'm only 22 years old. The country has been repressed since I was born. So these conditions are no strangers to us. It's like what we have lived with every day inside Burma. And that's why I can recount things with a smile, even if it is a terrible incident. But although we may be smiling, we feel it in our hearts. They're full of pain for the suffering we have seen. When Aung San Suu Kyi was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize, no one quite knew what the effect would be. But everyone was hopeful that it would put pressure on the Burmese military to hand over power to the elected party. Aung San Suu Kyi, seen here addressing a rally just before the Burmese government decided to silence her. She may not even know that today she's been honoured with the Nobel Peace Prize. The Nobel Committee said that her struggle to bring peace and human rights to her country has been one of the most extraordinary examples of civil courage in Asia in recent decades. In Norway, Aung San Suu Kyi's eldest son accepted the Nobel Peace Prize on her behalf. Even those in power now in Rangoon must know that their eventual fate will be that of all totalitarian regimes who seek to impose their authority through fear, repression and hatred.
The day after the Nobel presentation, we started getting news of more demonstrations in Rangoon. I really admired the Burmese people. I couldn't believe it that after all they'd been through, they'd still put their lives on the line to protest. We can see our goal, a ray of hope. But when we try to predict the future, instead of starting from the beginning, we are going to have to talk about starting a long way behind, because our country has a lot of debts. When we start to repair our country, we the young people will have an active role to play. Our duty does not finish with democracy. All the people of our age have a duty to perform in the reconstruction of our country. We may not even enjoy the fruits of our labour, but nevertheless, it is something we are going to have to do. Everybody, students inside these camps, as well as students inside Burma, and those who have left the country are classed by our government as young rebels. Students who have tried to go back inside Burma have been arrested and tortured. Students here, including myself, all miss our home. I want to go back, but I've never tried to go home. There didn't seem much point in Sophie and I staying on any longer. We thought that back home we might be able to do something to help increase the international pressure on the Burmese government so that the students and our friends could go home. That was always the big difference between us and the students. We had our passports. We had a choice. At any time, we could get on a plane and fly home to Australia. They can't go anywhere. Their choice is the Burmese military or a Thai refugee camp. And that's why Sophie and I are now committed to political change in Burma. <laughs>